Chapter Fifty One of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter Fifty One. The Wolf and the Seven Kids. There was once an old nanny goat who had seven kids, and she was just as fond of them as a mother of her children. One day she was going into the woods to fetch some food for them, so she called them up to her and said, My dear children, I am going out into the woods. Beware of the wolf. If once he gets into the house, he will eat you up, skin and hair and all. The rascal often disguises himself, but you will know him by his rough voice and his black feet. The kids said, Oh, we will be very careful, dear mother. You may be quite happy about us. Bleating tenderly, the old goat went off to her work. Before long, someone knocked at the door and cried, Open the door, dear children. Your mother has come back and brought something for each of you. But the kids knew quite well by the voice that it was the wolf. We won't open the door, they cried. You are not our mother. She has a soft, gentle voice, but yours is rough, and we are quite sure that you are the wolf. So he went away to a shop and bought a lump of chalk, which he ate, and it made his voice quite soft. He went back, knocked at the door again, and cried, Open the door, dear children. Your mother has come back and brought something for each of you. But the wolf had put one of his paws on the window sill, where the kids saw it and cried, We won't open the door. Our mother has not got a black foot as you have. You are the wolf. Then the wolf ran to the baker and said, I have bruised my foot. Please put some dough on it. And when the baker had put some dough on his foot, he ran to the miller and said, Strew some flour on my foot. The miller thought, The old wolf is going to take somebody in, and refused. But the wolf said, If you don't do it, I will eat you up. So the miller was frightened and whitened the wolf's paws. People are like that, you know. Now the wretch went for the third time to the door and knocked and said, Open the door, children. Your dear mother has come home and has brought something for each of you out of the wood. The kids cried, Show us your feet first, that we may be sure you are our mother. He put his paws on the window sill, and when the kids saw that these were white, they believed all he said and opened the door. Alas, it was the wolf who walked in. They were terrified and tried to hide themselves. One ran under the table, the second jumped into bed, the third into the oven, the fourth ran into the kitchen, the fifth got into the cupboard, the sixth into the wash-tub, and the seventh hid in the tall clock-case. But the wolf found them all but one, and made short work of them. He swallowed one after the other, except the youngest one in the clock-case, whom he did not find. When he had satisfied his appetite, he took himself off and lay down in a meadow outside, where he soon fell asleep. Not long after, the old nanny goat came back from the woods. Oh, what a terrible sight met her eyes! The house door was wide open, table, chairs, and benches were overturned, the washing bowl was smashed to atoms, the covers and pillows torn from the bed. She searched all over the house for her children, but nowhere were they to be found. She called them by name, one by one, but no one answered. At last, when she came to the youngest, a tiny voice cried, I am here, dear mother, hidden in the clock case. She brought him out, and he told her that the wolf had come and devoured all the others. You may imagine how she wept over her children. At last, in her grief, she went out, and the youngest kid ran by her side. When they went into the meadow, there lay the wolf under a tree, making the branches shake with his snores. They examined him from every side, and they could plainly see movements within his distended body. Oh, heavens, thought the goat, is it possible that my poor children, whom he ate for his supper, should still be alive? She sent the kid running to the house to fetch scissors, needles, and thread. Then she cut a hole in the monster's side, and hardly had she begun when a kid popped out its head, and as soon as the hole was big enough, all six jumped out, one after the other, all alive and without having suffered the least injury, for in his greed the monster had swallowed them whole. You may imagine the mother's joy. She hugged them and skipped about like a tailor on his wedding day. At last she said, Go and fetch some big stones, children, and we will fill up the greedy beast's body while he is asleep. 
Then the seven kids brought a lot of stones, as fast as they could carry them, and stuffed the wolf with them till he could hold no more. The old mother quickly sewed him up, without his having noticed anything or even moved. At last, when the wolf had had his sleep out, and got upon his legs, he found he was very thirsty, and he wished to go to the spring to drink. But as soon as he began to move, the stones began to tumble about in his body, and he cried out, what rattles, what rattles, against my poor bones, surely not little goats, but only big stones. And when he came to the brook, he stooped down to drink, and the heavy stones made him lose his balance, so that he fell and sank beneath the water. As soon as the seven little goats saw this, they came running up, singing aloud, The wolf is dead, the wolf is dead, and they danced for joy around their mother by the side of the brook. End of chapter 51 Recording by Evan Smith Chapter 52 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wigan The Elves and the Shoemaker There was once a shoemaker who, through no fault of his own, had become so poor that at last he had only leather enough left for one pair of shoes. At evening he cut out the shoes which he intended to begin upon the next morning, and since he had a good conscience, he lay down quietly, said his prayers, and fell asleep. In the morning, when he had prayed as usual, and was preparing to sit down to work, he found the pair of shoes standing finished on his table. He was amazed, and could not understand it in the least. He took the shoes in his hand to examine them more closely. They were so neatly sewn, that not a stitch was out of place, and were as good as the work of a master hand. Soon after, a purchaser came in, and as he was much pleased with the shoes, he paid more than the ordinary price for them, so that the shoemaker was able to buy leather for two pairs with the money. He cut them out in the evening, and, next day, with fresh courage was about to go to work, but he had no need to, for when he got up the shoes were finished, and buyers were not lacking. These gave him so much money that he was able to buy leather for four pairs of shoes. Early next morning he found the four pairs finished, and so it went on. What he cut out at evening was finished in the morning, so that he was soon again in comfortable circumstances, and became a well-to-do man. Now it happened one evening, not long before Christmas, when he had cut out shoes as usual, that he said to his wife, How would it be if we were to sit up to-night to see who it is that lends us such a helping hand? The wife agreed, lighted a candle, and they hid themselves in the corner of the room, behind the clothes which were hanging there. At midnight came two little naked men, who sat down at the shoemaker's table, took up the cut-out work, and began with their tiny fingers to stitch, sew, and hammer, so neatly and quickly, that the shoemaker could not believe his eyes. They did not stop till everything was quite finished, and then stood complete on the table. Then they ran swiftly away. The next day the wife said, The little men have made us rich, and we ought to show our gratitude. They run about with nothing on, and must freeze with cold. Now I will make them little shirts, coats, waistcoats, and hose, and will even knit them stout stockings and you shall make them each a pair of shoes. The husband agreed, and at evening, when they had everything ready, they laid out the presents on the table, and hid themselves to see how the little men would behave. 
at midnight they came skipping in and were about to set to work but instead of the leather ready cut out they found the charming little clothes at first they were surprised then excessively delighted with the greatest speed they put on and smoothed down the pretty clothes singing now we're dressed so fine and neat why cobble more for others feet then they hopped and danced about and leaped over chairs and tables and out at the door henceforward they came back no more but the shoemaker fared well as long as he lived and had good luck in all his undertakings end of chapter fifty two recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter fifty three of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org tales of laughter by nora archibald smith and kate douglas wiggin chapter fifty three king wren once upon a time the cuckoo gave a big tea party it was a grand affair i can tell you every bird of note was present from the eagle down to the sparrow all the finches were there the larks crows and swallows so how they managed to seat them all is more than i can tell now the cuckoo was a wise old bird and she never took a step of this sort without a reason you sometimes hear people say as silly as a cuckoo but you may take my word for it it is only because they know nothing at all about her well a bright idea had occurred to the cuckoo and it was just this she thought it was high time the birds chose a king of their own if they had a king you see they might in time be able to have a court circular which would sound very grand besides who knew but that in the future some of her own family might even marry royalty yes it was a good idea she thought but the other birds would have to be consulted first so she gave a big tea party and fed them all up with the finest worms and dainties to be had just to put them into a good temper even the hungry sparrow finished eating at last and you have no idea what his appetite was like and then the cuckoo broke the news gently that she thought they ought to have a king to manage their affairs for them now this caused no end of commotion and there they sat fathers mothers uncles and cousins all talking away at the same time just then the cock and hen passed by taking a little airing you must know that they had heard nothing about the tea party they were just the cock and hen and it did not matter much what they thought so they did not get an invitation what what cried the hen when she heard the dreadful din of course the cock understood her language and knew that she was asking what was going on i'll find out my dear he answered and he inquired from a fat green frog they want to choose a king over the birds he told the hen a minute after stuff and nonsense clucked the hen only it did not sound quite like that because she spoke in her own language you see well the end of it all was that everybody was in favour of a king save the plover and he cried i have been free all my life and i'll die free then away he flew to a dismal swamp and was seen no more so they agreed to meet again next morning if it was fine their king was to be the bird who could fly higher than all the rest and they wanted a fine day so that nobody could say afterward i could have flown much higher only it was so windy or something of that sort the next day was perfect so they all gathered together in the big meadow when the cuckoo had counted three they all rose up with one accord into the air making such a cloud of dust that for a moment you could not see a thing higher and higher they went but one by one the little birds had to give up and in the end the eagle was the only bird left flying and he looked as though he had reached the sun itself but a tiny little bird had joined them unasked and he had not even a name nobody noticed him hide himself among the feathers in the eagle's back so when the cuckoo had counted three 
up he went with the rest, although they did not know it. Now when the eagle saw that all the others had given up, he, too, began to descend. Then out flew the little bird without a name, and up he went, much higher still. "'I am king! I am king!' cried the eagle when he reached the ground. "'Not at all!' replied the little bird without a name, "'for I have flown higher still.' And then down he came. "'I am king! I am king!' he chirped, as soon as he got his breath again. "'You crafty little creature!' they shouted with one voice. "'We will have another test, and a fair one this time.' So the bird who could fall deepest into the earth was to be their king, they said. Well, the cock set to work and began to grub a hole in the ground, while the duck jumped down into a grave, but unluckily she sprained her foot, and she waddled off, saying, Bad work, bad work. But the little bird without a name crept right into a mouse hole and cried shrilly, I am king, I am king. Then we will show you how we treat our royalty, cried the angry birds. We will keep you in the mouse hole and starve you. So they set the owl to keep watch over the hole during the night, and if he let the bird go, he was to be put to death on the spot. The others were all so tired and weary that they flew home and went to bed. Now when he had stared into the hole for two whole hours, the poor owl began to feel very sleepy, so he went to sleep with one eye and watched intently with the other, and all went well for a time. But, as luck would have it, when he shut one eye, after a while he forgot to open the other, and you may be sure that the little bird without a name soon made his escape from his prison. After that the poor old owl never dared show his face again by day, for fear the birds would put him to death. He flies about all night long, and he is a great enemy of the little mice, because they make such, to him, unfortunate holes. As for the little bird without a name, he did not feel very safe either, so he always hid in the hedges, and when he felt pretty secure he would cry out, I am king, I am king. In time the other birds grew to call him the hedge king, just for scorn, and that means wren. That is how he came by his name. End of chapter 53《Chapter 54 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 54 Why the Bear Has a Stumpy Tail. One winter's day, the bear met the fox, who came slinking along with a string of fish he had stolen. "'Hey, stop a minute. Where did you get those from?' demanded the bear. "'Oh, my Lord Bruin, I've been out fishing and caught them,' said the fox. So the bear had a mind to learn to fish too, and bade the fox tell him how he was to set about it. "'Oh, it's quite easy,' answered the fox, and soon learned. "'You've only got to go upon the ice and cut a hole and stick your tail down through it "'and hold it there as long as you can. "'You're not to mind if it smarts a little. "'That's when the fish bite. "'The longer you hold it there, the more fish you'll get. "'And then, all at once, out with it, "'with a cross pull sideways and a strong pull, too.' "'Well, the bear did as the fox said, "'and though he felt very cold and his tail smarted very much, "'he kept it a long, long time down in the hole,' till at last it was frozen in, though of course he did not know that. Then he pulled it out with a strong pull, and it snapped short off, and that's why Bruin goes about with a stumpy tail to this day. End of chapter 54. Recording by Evan Smith. Chapter 55 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Three Ways to Build a House There was once upon a time a pig 
who lived with her three children in a large comfortable old-fashioned farmyard the eldest of the little pigs was called brownie the second whitey and the youngest and best-looking blacky now brownie was a very dirty little pig and i am sorry to say spent most of his time rolling and wallowing about in the mud he was never so happy as on a wet day when the mud in the farmyard was soft and thick and smooth then he would steal away from his mother's side and finding the muddiest place in the yard would roll about in it and thoroughly enjoy himself his mother often found fault with him for this and would shake her head sadly and say ah brownie some day you will be sorry that you did not obey your old mother but no words of advice or warning could cure brownie of his bad habits whitey was quite a clever little pig but she was greedy she was always thinking of her food and looking forward to her dinner when the farm girl was seen carrying the pails across the yard she would rise up on her hind legs and dance and caper with excitement as soon as the food was poured into the trough she jostled blacky and brownie out of the way in her eagerness to get the best and biggest bits for herself her mother often scolded her for her selfishness and told her that some day she would suffer for being so greedy blacky was a nice little pig neither dirty nor greedy he had nice dainty ways for a pig and his skin was always as smooth and shining as black satin he was much cleverer than either brownie or whitey and his mother's heart used to swell with pride when she heard the farmer's friends say to each other that some day the little black fellow would be a prize pig now the time came when the mother pig felt old and feeble and near her end one day she called the three little pigs around her and said my children i feel that i am growing old and weak and that i shall not live long before i die i should like to build a house for each of you as this dear old sigh in which we have lived so happily will be given to a new family of pigs and you will have to turn out now brownie what sort of house would you like to have a house of mud replied brownie looking longly at a wet puddle in the corner of the yard and you whitey said the mother pig in rather a sad voice for she was disappointed that brownie had made so foolish a choice a house of cabbage answered whitey with a mouth full and scarcely raising her snout out of the trough in which she was grabbing for some potato parings foolish foolish child said the mother pig looking quite distressed and you blacky turning to her youngest son what sort of house shall i order for you a house of brick please mother as it will be warm in winter cool in summer and safe all year round that is a sensible little pig replied his mother looking fondly at him i will see that the three houses are made ready at once and now one last piece of advice you have heard me talk of our old enemy the fox when he hears that i am dead he is sure to try and get hold of you to carry you off to his den he is very sly and will no doubt disguise himself and pretend to be a friend but you must promise me not to let him enter your houses on any pretext whatever and the little pigs readily promised for they had always had a great fear of the fox of whom they had heard many terrible tales a short time afterward the old pig died and the little pigs went to live in their own houses brownie was quite delighted with his soft mud walls and with the clay floor which soon looked like nothing but a big mud pie but that was what brownie enjoyed and he was as happy as possible rolling about all day and making himself exceedingly dirty one day as he was lying half asleep in the mud 
he heard a soft knock at his door and a gentle voice said may i come in master brownie i want to see your beautiful new house who are you said brownie starting up in a great fright for though the voice sounded gentle he felt sure it was feigned voice and he feared it was the fox i am a friend come to call on you answered the voice no no replied brownie i don't believe you are a friend you are the wicked fox against whom our mother warned us i won't let you in oh is that the way you answer me said the fox speaking very roughly in his natural voice we shall soon see who is master here and with his paws he set to work and scraped a large hole in the soft mud walls a moment later he had jumped through it and catching brownie by his neck flung him on his shoulders and trotted off with him to his den the next day as whitey was munching a few leaves of cabbage out of the corner of her house the fox stole up to her door determined to carry her off to join her brother in his den he began speaking to her in the same feigned gentle voice in which he had spoken to brownie but it frightened her very much when he said i am a friend come to visit you and to have some of your good cabbage for my dinner please don't touch it cried whitey in great distress the cabbages are on the walls of my house and if you eat them you will make a hole and the wind and rain will come in and give me a cold do go away i am sure you are not a friend but our wicked enemy the fox and poor whitey began to whine and to whimper and to wish that she had not been such a greedy little pig and had chosen a more solid material than cabbages for her house but it was too late now and in another minute the fox had eaten his way through the cabbage walls and had caught the trembling shivering whitey and carried her off to his den the next day the fox started off for blackie's house because he had made up his mind that he would get the three little pigs together in his den then kill them and invite all his friends to a feast but when he reached the brick house he found that the door was bolted and barred so in his sly manner he began do let me in dear blackie i have brought you a present of some eggs that i picked up in a farmyard on my way here no no mr fox replied Baki. i am not going to open my door to you i know your cunning ways you have carried off poor brownie and whitey but you are not going to get me at this the fox was so angry that he dashed with all his force against the wall and tried to knock it down but it was too strong and well built and though the fox scraped and tore at the bricks with his paws he only hurt himself and last he had to give up and limp away with his forepaws all bleeding and sore never mind he cried angrily as he went off i'll catch you another day see if i don't and i won't grind your bones to powder when i have got you in my den and he snarled fiercely and showed his teeth next day blacky had to go into the neighboring town to do some marketing and to buy a big kettle as he was walking home with it slung over his shoulder he heard a sound of steps stealthily creeping after him for a moment his heart stood still with fear and then a happy thought came to him he had just reached the top of a hill and could see his own little house nestling at the foot of it among the trees in a moment he had snatched the lid off the kettle and had jumped in himself coiling himself round he lay quite snug in the bottom of the kettle while his foreleg he managed to put the lid on so that he was entirely hidden with a little kick from inside he started the kettle off and down the hill it rolled full tilt when the fox came up all that he saw was a large black kettle spinning over the ground at a great pace 
very disappointed he was just going to turn away when he saw the kettle stop close to the little brick house and in a moment blacky jumped out of it and escaped with it in safely inside when he barred and bolted the door and put the shutter up over the window oh exclaimed the fox to himself you think you will escape me that way do you we shall soon see about that my friend and very quietly and stealthily he prowled round the house looking for some way to climb on to the roof in the meantime blacky had filled the kettle with water and having put it on the fire sat down quietly waiting for it to boil just as the kettle was beginning to sing and steam to come out of the spout he heard a sound like a soft muffled step patter 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 overhead and the next moment the fox's head and forepaws were seen coming down the chimney but blacky very wisely had not put the lid on the kettle and with a yelp of pain the fox fell into the boiling water and before he could escape blacky had popped the lid on and the fox was scalded to death as soon as he was sure that their wicked enemy was really dead and could do them no further harm blacky started off to rescue brownie and whitey as he approached the den he heard piteous grunts and squeals from his poor little brother and sister who lived in constant terror of the fox killing and eating them but when they saw blacky appear at the entrance to the den their joy knew no bounds he quickly found a sharp stone and cut the cords by which they were tied to a stake in the ground and then all three started off together for blacky's house where they lived happily ever after and brownie quite gave up rolling in the mud and whitey ceased to be greedy for they never forgot how nearly these faults had brought them to an untimely end end of chapter fifty five recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Chapter Fifty Six of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter Fifty Six. How to Tell a True Princess. There was once upon a time a prince who wanted to marry a princess but she must be a true princess. So he traveled through the whole world to find one, but there was always something against each. There were plenty of princesses, but he could not find out if they were true princesses. In every case there was some little defect which showed the genuine article was not yet found. So he came home again in very low spirits, for he had wanted very much to have a true princess. One night there was a dreadful storm, it thundered and lightened, and the rain streamed down in torrents. It was fearful. There was a knocking heard at the palace gate, and the old king went to open it. There stood a princess outside the gate, but oh, and what a sad plight she was from the rain and the storm. The water was running down from her hair and her dress into the points of her shoes, and out at the heels again. And yet, she said, she was a true princess. Well, we shall soon find that, thought the old queen. But she said nothing, and went into the sleeping-room, took off all the bedclothes, and laid a pea on the bottom of the bed. Then she put twenty mattresses on top of the pea, and twenty eider-down quilts on top of the mattresses, and this was the bed in which the princess was to sleep. The next morning she was asked how she slept. "'Oh, very badly,' said the princess. "'I scarcely closed my eyes all night. I am sure I don't know what was in the bed.' I lay on something so hard that my whole body is black and blue. It is dreadful. Now they perceived that she was a true princess, because she had felt the pea through the twenty mattresses and the twenty eider-down quilts. No one but a true princess could be so sensitive. So the prince married her, for now he knew that at last he had got hold of a true princess, and the pea was put into the royal museum, where it is still to be seen if no one has stolen it. Now this is a true story. End of chapter 56
Recording by Evan Smith. Chapter 57 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 57 The Five Servants. Once upon a time, in a country far away, there lived and ruled an old queen who had such a wicked heart that she was not happy unless she was working evil to others she had one daughter who was very beautiful and whom she made use of to further her own evil plans for whenever a suitor came to apply for her hand the old queen set him an impossible task and chopped off his head without any pity when he could not perform it now in another country there lived a young prince who had heard of this lovely girl and he begged his father to let him go and try his luck not a bit of it said the king you would only lose your head like the rest but the prince was very anxious to go and when he found his father was firm he fell ill and took to his bed for seven years and not all the doctors in the land could make him well again or restore his fallen spirits then the father knew that the lad must die unless he was allowed to have his own way so he said get up my son and try your fate at these joyful words the boy jumped out of bed quite recovered and you may be sure it was not long before he was ready for his journey and on the road one day as he was swinging along over hill and dale the fern and brake he saw a great big thing lying by the roadside at first he thought it was a huge animal but as he drew nearer he saw that it was really an enormously fat man who was as round and jolly as you can imagine seeing the traveller he rose to his feet and i do believe the earth trembled as he did so if you are in need of a servant take me and you will not repent he said pulling off his cap and bowing why whatever should i do with a fat fellow as you answered the prince if i were three thousand times as fat it would not matter so long as i served you well said the man well that is very true replied the prince you may come along and i dare say i shall be able to put you to some use so they journeyed on together and presently they came upon a man lying with his ear pressed to the ground what are you doing asked the prince i am listening answered the man i can hear everything that is going on in the world even the growing of the grass ah said the prince then you can tell me what you hear in the palace of the old queen i hear the cutting off of a suitor's head come with me then said the prince for i can see that you will be useful a little further on they came upon a pair of legs lying stretched on the grass but they were so long that the travellers had to walk an hour before they came to the body and then nearly another hour before they reached the head well what a long strip of chap you are said the prince why master you have only seen me when i am lying down replied the man just you wait till i stand up i am thrice as tall as the highest mountain you have ever seen on your travels just let me come and be your servant and i promise that you will find me useful willingly answered the prince then they all went on their way again till they came to a wood and here they found a man who though he was lying in the full heat of the sun was shivering and shaking so that it was a wonder his teeth did not fall out of his head why my good man said the prince what makes you shiver so on this hot day alas groaned the man the hotter the day the colder i am the sun freezes the very marrow in my bones and when it is what you call cold i begin to grow hot so that i nearly burn to death i cannot bear cold because it is so hot nor heat because it is so cold well you are an odd fellow said the prince suppose you get up and join my train so the man agreed the next man they met was standing in a field turning his head from side to side in a way that made your neck ache to watch him what are you looking for asked the prince i am looking for nothing answered the man but i have such keen sight that i can see all over the world through woods and forests and hills and mountains nothing can escape my eyes well said the prince if you are willing to take service join my train for i have need of such as you 
then they all journeyed on together in a very merry fashion for the prince was light-hearted at the thought of his beautiful bride that was to be you see he had quite made up his mind to get the better of the wicked queen soon they reached the palace and the prince presented himself to the queen and said i am come to ask the hand of your daughter in marriage set me what task you like so long as i may marry her when it is done three tasks i will set you said the queen and when they are done you shall be her husband first you must find me the ring that i have dropped in the sea near the palace the prince went home to his servants and said now is your chance to prove your worth you must find me a ring that lies at the bottom of the sea i will see where it lies said the keen-sighted one and suddenly he shouted there it is it lies on a rock at the bottom of the waves i would soon fetch it if i could see it said the long man i can arrange that chimed in the fat one and he lay down beside the sea and began to drink and he drank and drank till the sea disappeared and the bottom lay stretched out before them as dry as a meadow then the long man took one stride and picked up the ring and brought it to the prince the old queen was very much surprised to see the ring but she concealed her annoyance and leading the youth to the window said in yonder field a hundred fat oxen are feeding you must eat them all before noon and in case you are thirsty you must drink the contents of the hundred casks of wine that are in the cellar certainly said the youth cheerfully but i should like to invite a friend to eat with me oh by all means replied the old hag with a smile so the prince went to his friends and told them the news you will help me today he said turning to the fat man and for once you will have a good meal so they went straightway to the field where the oxen were and in no time at all the fat man had gobbled up every one and still looked hungry then the prince took him down to the cellar and he quenched his thirst with the hundred casks of wine again the youth presented himself to the witch and astonished her with the news that the task was done oh ho my fine fellow she grumbled to herself i will catch you yet tonight she added aloud i will bring the princess and leave her to sit with you but beware lest you fall asleep for if i come at twelve and find the princess gone you are a lost man that does not sound difficult thought the prince surely i can keep awake if i want to so he told his servants what the third task was to be and they all agreed that a watch had better be kept lest the old woman should play some trick at nightfall the old queen brought her daughter to the prince's house and returned to the palace as soon as she was gone the long man wound himself around the house the listener lay with his ear to the ground the fat one stood in the doorway completely blocking the entrance and the keen-eyed one kept watch within sat the princess silent as a statue the moonlight lighting up her beautiful face with a radiant glory so that the prince could only gaze at her in awe and wonder so far it was well but at half past eleven a spell cast by the old queen fell on them all and they slept and immediately the princess was spirited away at quarter to twelve the spell lost its power and they awoke to discover what a calamity had fallen upon them oh woe is me woe is me cried the prince what can save us now and the faithful friends wept in unison suddenly the listener said hark be still and i will listen they were quiet at once and he listened for a moment i hear her bewailing her fate he cried then the keen-sighted man turned his head from side to side and cried joyfully i see her sitting on a rock three hundred miles away our long friend can reach her in two strides willingly cried the man and he was up and at the foot of the rock before the others could look around he took the princess in his arms and she was back at the prince's house just one moment before twelve and they all sat down together and rejoiced as the clock struck twelve the old woman came creeping along looking very spiteful as she thought she had really won this time for was not her daughter three hundred miles away she was not as we know and when the queen saw this she felt so angry she would like to have ordered all their heads to be chopped off there must be someone here who was cleverer than i she screamed and then she fell to crying but it was of no use the prince was firm as a rock and she had to consent to the wedding but she whispered to her daughter his servants have done everything for him aren't you ashamed to have a husband who can do nothing at all for himself 
the daughter had a proud and haughty temper and her pride began to rise up angrily so next day she commanded three hundred loads of wood to be brought and piled up in the palace yard and set alight then she told the prince that he had performed the tasks only by the help of his servants and before she would marry him some one must sit upon the woodpile and stay there until it was burned out for she thought no servant would do so much for him and he surely would have to do this himself however she was wrong for the freezing man claimed this as his share of the work and he mounted the woodpile without delay for three days and three nights it blazed away till only ashes were left and there stood the freezing man shivering like jelly if it had burned much longer i should have been benumbed with the cold he said with chattering teeth now the princess saw that she could delay no longer so they set off to the church but the queen made yet another attempt to prevent the wedding she called her attendants and sent them to waylay the party and kill everyone but the princess however the listener had been keeping his ears open and he heard this order so they put on more speed and reached the church first and were married at the church door the five servants took leave of their master and went out into the world to try their fortune alone the prince and his wife set forth on their homeward journey and at the end of the first day they came upon a village where a swineherd stood feeding his pigs do you know who i am said the prince to his wife yonder man is my father and our duty now is to tend the pigs with him they went into the cottage and during the night the prince took away her splendid clothes so that in the morning she had to put on an old dress and shoes belonging to the swineherd's wife these were given to her grudgingly and only for her husband's sake as the woman told her so the princess was now very miserable and believed that her husband was really a swineherd but she determined to make the best of it and turned to do her share of the work and said to herself it is a punishment for all my pride this went on for a week and then she was so worn out that she sat down by the wayside and burst into tears some kindly villagers asked her what was the matter and if she knew what her husband was he is a swineherd she answered and has just gone to market with some of his pigs come with us and we will show you where he is they said and they took her away over the hill to the king's palace and there in the hall stood her husband surrounded by courtiers and so richly dressed that she did not know him till he fell upon her neck saying we have borne much for each other now let us be happy then there was great rejoicing and the marriage feast was celebrated and all i can say is that i wish we had been there to share the merrymaking end of chapter 57 Chapter fifty eight of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Estelle Evans, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter fifty eight The Hare and the Fox a hare and a fox were traveling together it was winter time not a blade of grass was to be seen nor a bird or mouse stirred in the fields it's hungry weather said the fox to the hare i feel as hollow as an eggshell and so do i said the hare i'm hungry enough to eat my own ears if only i could reach them when they had gone a little way they spied a peasant girl coming towards them she carried a basket and out of the basket came a very pleasant smell the smell of hot rolls i'll tell you what said the fox you lay down and pretend to be dead the girl will put down her basket to take you up for the sake of your skin out of hare skins they make gloves then i'll snatch the rolls and we'll have a splendid meal the hare did as the fox told him fell down and pretended to be dead while the fox hid behind a snowdrift the girl came along saw the hare with his legs stretched out stiff and stark put down her basket sure enough and stooped over the hare the fox snatched up the basket and scampered off with it the hare in a twinkling came to life and followed his companion but he ran on ahead and showed quite plainly that he meant to keep all the rolls to himself but that was not what the hare had bargained for you may guess so when they came to a little lake he called out to the fox 
what do you say to catching a dish of fish then we should have fish and rolls to eat like any lord just dangle your tail down in the water the fish haven't had much to bite these days so they're bound to hang on to your tail you must make haste though before the lake freezes over well the fox thought that was a good idea so he went to the lake which was just beginning to freeze and dangled his tail in the water in a very short time the tail was frozen in now the hare took the basket gobbled up the rolls one after the other as comfortably as you please right in front of the fox's face wait till it thaws he said to the fox wait till spring wait till it thaws and then he ran away and the fox was so angry at the way he had been caught that he barked and barked like a savage dog on a chain end of chapter fifty eight the hare and the fox chapter fifty nine of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by estelle evans pittsburgh pennsylvania tales of laughter by nora archibald smith and kate douglas wigman chapter fifty nine the story of zirak once upon a time a raven a rat and a tortoise having agreed to be friends together were having a pleasant chat when they saw a wild goat making its way towards them with surprising swiftness they took it for granted by her speed that she was pursued by some hunter and they at once without ceremony separated every one to take care of himself the tortoise slipped into the water the rat crept into a hole which he fortunately found near at hand and the raven hid himself among the boughs of a very high tree in the meantime the goat stopped quite suddenly and stood to rest herself by the side of the fountain when the raven who had looked all around and perceived no one called to the tortoise who immediately peeped above the water and seeing the goat afraid to drink said drink boldly my dear friend for the water is very clear after the goat had done so the tortoise continued pray tell me what is the reason you appear in such distress reason enough said the goat for i have just made my escape out of the hands of a hunter who pursued me with an eager chase come said the tortoise i am glad you are safe i have an offer to make you if you like our company stay here and be one of our friends you will find our hearts honest and our company useful to you the sages say that a number of friends lessens trouble after this short speech the raven and the rat joined in the invitation so the goat at once promised to become one of them each promising to the other to prove himself a real and true friend whatever might happen in days to come after this agreement these four lived in perfect harmony for a very long time and spent their time pleasantly together but one day as the tortoise the rat and the raven were met as they used to do by the side of the fountain the goat was missing this gave great trouble to them as they knew not what had happened they very soon came to a resolution however to seek for and assist the goat so the raven at once mounted into the air to see what discoveries he could make and looking round about him at length to his great sorrow he saw at a distance the poor goat entangled in a hunter's net he immediately dropped down in order to acquaint the rat and the tortoise with what he had seen and you may be sure that there was ill tidings caused great grief what shall we do said they we have promised firm friendship to one another and lived very happily together so long said the tortoise that it would be very shameful to break the bond and not act up to all we said we cannot leave our innocent and good-natured companion in this, this dire distress and great danger no we must find a way to deliver our poor friend goat out of captivity said the raven to the rat who was nicknamed zirak remember o oh excellent zirak there is none but thyself able to set our friend at liberty and the business must be done quickly for fear 
the huntsman should lay his hands upon her. Doubt not, replied Xerox, but that I will do my best, so let us go at once, at no time may be lost. On this the raven took up Xerox in his bill, and they flew and flew with him to the place where the poor goat was confined in the net. No sooner had he arrived than he at once commenced to gnaw on the meshes of the net that held the goat's foot, and almost set him at liberty when he noticed the tortoise had arrived. As soon as the goat saw the tortoise, she cried out in a loud voice, Oh, why have you ventured to come hither, friend tortoise? Because I could no longer bear your absence, replied the tortoise. Dear friend, said the goat, your coming to this place troubles me as much as the loss of my own liberty. For if the hunter should happen to come, what would you do to make your escape? For my part, I am almost free, and my being able to run will prevent me from falling into his hands again. Our friend the raven can safely fly, and Zira can run into a hole. Only you, who are so slow of foot, will become the hunter's prey. No sooner had the goat thus spoken, when sure enough the hunter appeared. But the goat, being free, swiftly ran away. The raven mounted into the air, and Zirak slipped into a hole. And true enough, as the goat had said, only the slow-paced tortoise remained without help. When the hunter arrived, he was a little surprised to see his net broken and the goat missing. This was no small vexation to him, and caused him to look closely around to see if he could discover who had done the mischief, and unfortunately, in thus searching, he spied the tortoise. Oh, oh, he said, very good, I am glad to see you here. I find I shall not go home empty-handed after all. Here is a plump tortoise, and that is worth something, I'm sure. Thus saying, he took up the tortoise, put it in a sack, and threw the sack over his shoulder, and soon was trudging home. After he had gone, the three friends came out from their several hiding places, and met together. When, missing the tortoise, they at once judged what had become of him. Then, utter, uttering bitter cries and lamentations, they shed torrents of tears. At length the raven broke the silence and said, Dear friends, our moans and sorrows do not help the tortoise. We must, if at all possible, to devise some means of saving his life. Our sages have often told us that there are three persons that are never well known to be on special occasions, men of courage in fight, men of honesty in business, and a true friend in extreme necessity. We find, alas, our dear companion tortoise is in a sad condition, and therefore we must, if possible, help him. It is the first-class advice, replied Xerox. Now that I think I know how it can be done, let our friend Goat go and show herself to the hunter, who will then be certain to lay down his sack to run after her. All right, said the Goat. I will pretend to be lame and run limping in a, at a little distance before him, which will encourage him to follow me and thus draw him a good way away from the sack which will give Zerak time to set our friend at liberty. This plan appeared to be such a good one that it was at once approved of, and immediately the goat ran halting before the hunter, and appeared to be so feeble and faint that her pursuer thought he had her safe in his clutches again. And so, laying down his sack, ran after the goat with all his might. That cunning creature suffered him now and again almost to come upon her, and then led him on another wild goose chase until at last she had lured him out of sight, which Zerak, seeing, began gnawing at the strings that tied the mouth of the sack, and soon set the tortoise free, who went at once and hid himself in a thick bush. At length the hunter tired of running after his prey and gave up the chase, and returned to his sack. Here, he said, I have something safe, 
thou art not quite so swift as that plaguing goat, and if thou wert art all too well confined here to find the way to make thy little legs any use to thee. So saying, he went to the bag, but not finding the tortoise, he was amazed, and he thought himself in a region of hobgoblins and spirits, since he had been by some mysterious means lost two valuable objects, a goat and a tortoise. He did not know, you see, what wonders true friendship can work when all are pledged to help one another. The four friends soon met again and congratulated one another on their escapes, made afresh their vows of friendship, and declared that they would never separate until death parted them. End of chapter 59「Chapter Sixty of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wigan. Chapter Sixty. Johnny Cake. Once upon a time there was an old man and an old woman and a little boy. One morning the old woman made a johnny cake and put it in the oven to bake. You watch the johnny cake while your father and I go out to work in the garden, she said. So the old man and the old woman went out and began to hoe potatoes and left the little boy to tend the oven. But he didn't watch it all the time, and all of a sudden he heard a noise, and he looked up and the oven door popped open, and out of the oven jumped johnny cake and went rolling along end over end toward the open door of the house. The little boy ran to shut the door, but Johnny Cake was too quick for him and rolled through the door, down the steps, and out into the road long before the little boy could catch him. The little boy ran after him as fast as he could clip it, crying out to his father and mother, who heard the uproar, and threw down their hoes and gave chase too. But Johnny Cake outran all three a long way and was soon out of sight, while they had to sit down, all out of breath, on a bank to rest. On went Johnny Cake, and by and by he came to two well-diggers, who looked up from their work and called out, "'Where are you going, Johnny Cake?' He said, "'I've outrun an old man, and an old woman, and a little boy, and I can outrun you too oo oo "'You can, can you? We'll see about that,' said they, and they threw down their picks and ran after him, but couldn't catch up with him, and soon they had to sit down by the roadside to rest." On ran Johnny Cake, and by and by he came to two ditch-diggers who were digging a ditch. "'Where are you going, Johnny Cake?' said they. He said, "'I've outrun an old man, and an old woman, and a little boy, and two well-diggers, and I can outrun you too, oo oo "'You can, can you? We'll see about that,' said they, and they threw down their spades and ran after him too. But Johnny Cake soon outstripped them also, and seeing they could never catch him, they gave up the chase and sat down to rest. On went Johnny Cake, and by and by he came to a bear. The bear said, Where are you going, Johnny Cake? He said, I've outrun an old man, and an old woman, and a little boy, and two well-diggers, and two ditch-diggers, and I can outrun you too, oo oo You can, can you? growled the bear. We'll see about that and trotted as fast as his legs could carry him after Johnny Cake, who never stopped to look behind him. Before long the bear was left so far behind that he saw he might as well give up the hunt first as last, so he stretched himself out by the roadside to rest. On went Johnny Cake, and by and by he came to a wolf. The wolf said, "'Where are you going, Johnny Cake?' He said, "'I've outrun an old man, and an old woman, and a little boy, and two well-diggers, and two ditch-diggers, and a bear, and I can outrun you too, oo oo "'You can, can you?' snarled the wolf. "'We'll see about that.' And he set into a gallop after Johnny Cake, who went on and on so fast that the wolf saw there was no hope of overtaking him, and he too lay down to rest. On went Johnny Cake, and by and by he came to a fox that lay quietly in a corner of the fence.' The fox called out in a sharp voice, but without getting up, "'Where are you going, Johnny Cake?' He said, "'I've outrun an old man, and an old woman, and a little boy, and two well-diggers, and two ditch-diggers, a bear, and a wolf, and I can outrun you too, oo oo The fox said, "'I can't quite hear you, Johnny Cake. Won't you come a little closer?' turning his head a little to one side. 
Johnny Cake stopped his race for the first time and went a little closer and called out in a very loud voice, I've outrun an old man and an old woman and a little boy and two well diggers and two ditch diggers and a bear and a wolf, and I can outrun you too, woo woo. Can't quite hear you. Won't you come a little closer, said the fox in a feeble voice, as he stretched out his neck toward Johnny Cake and put one paw behind his ear. Johnny Cake came up closer and leaning toward the fox, screamed out, I've outrun an old man and an old woman and a little boy and two well diggers and two ditch diggers and a bear and a wolf, and I can outrun you too, woo woo. You can, can you, yelped the fox, and he snapped up Johnny Cake in his sharp teeth in the twinkling of an eye. End of chapter 60 Recording by Evan Smith Chapter 61 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. The Wee Wee Manny. Once upon a time, when all big folks were wee ones, and all lies were true, there was a wee, wee manny that had a big, big coo, and out he went to milk her of a morning, and said, Hold still, my coo, my hinny, hold still, my hinny, my coo, and ye shall have for your dinner what but a milk white do. But the big, big coo wouldn't hold still. Hout, said the wee, wee manny. Hold still, my coo, my dearie, and fill my bucket with milk. And if ye be no contrary, I'll gie ye a gown o' silk. But the big, big coo wouldn't hold still. Look at that now, said the wee, wee manny. What's a wee wee manny to do with such a big contrary coo? So off he went to his mother at the house. Mither, he said, coo won't stand still, and wee wee manny can't milk big big coo. Hout, said his mother, take stick and beat coo. So off he went to get a stick from the tree, and said, break stick break and i'll get ye a cake but the stick wouldn't break so back he went to the house mother said he coo wouldn't hold still stick wouldn't break wee wee manny can't beat big big coo hout said his mother go to the butcher and bid him kill coo so off he went to the butcher and said butcher kill the big big coo she'll give us no more milk new no. but the butcher wouldn't kill the coo without a silver penny so back the manny went to the house mither said he coo wouldn't hold still stick wouldn't break butcher won't kill without a silver penny and we we manny can't milk big big coo well said his mother go to the coo and tell her there's a weary weary lady with long hair weeping for a cup o milk so off he went and told the coo but she wouldn't hold still so back he went and told his mother well said she tell the coo there's a fine fine laddie from the wars sitting by the weary weary lady with golden hair and she weeping for a sup o milk so off he went and told the coo but she wouldn't hold still so back he went and told his mother well said his mother tell the big big coo there's a sharp sharp sword at the belt of the fine fine laddie from the wars who sits beside the weary weary lady with the golden hair and she's weepin for a sup o milk and he told the big big coo but she wouldn't hold still 
then said the mother run quick and tell her that her head's going to be cut off by the sharp sharp sword in the hands of the fine fine laddie if she doesn't give the sup o milk the weary weary lady weeps for and wee wee manny went off and told the big big coo and when coo saw the glint of the sharp sharp sword in the hand of the fine fine laddie come from the wars and the weary weary lady weeping for a sup o milk she reckoned she better hold still so wee wee manny milk big big coo and the weary weary lady with the golden hair hushed her weeping and got her sup o milk and the fine fine laddie now come from the wars put his sharp sharp sword and all went well that didn't go ill End of chapter 61 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 62 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c tales of laughter by nora archibald smith and kate douglas wiggin sir gammer vans last sunday morning at six o'clock in the evening as i was sailing over the tops of the mountains in my little boat i met two men on horseback riding on one mare so i asked them could they tell me whether the little old woman was dead yet who was hanged last saturday week for drowning herself in a shower of feathers they said they could not inform me positively but if i went to sir gammer vans he could tell me all about it but how am i to know the house said i ho oh, tis easy enough said they for tis a brick house built entirely of flints standing alone by itself in the middle of sixty or seventy others just like it oh nothing in the world is easier said i nothing can be easier said they so i went on my way now this sir g fans was a giant and a bottle maker and as all giants who are bottle makers usually pop out of a little thumb bottle from behind the door so did sir g vance how do you do says he very well i thank you says i have some breakfast with me with all my heart says i so he gave me a slice of beer and a cup of cold veal and there was a little dog under the table that picked up all the crumbs hang him says i no don't hang him says he for he killed a hare yesterday and if you don't believe me i'll show you the hare alive in a basket so he took me into his garden to show me the curiosities in one corner there was a fox hatching eagle's eggs in another there was an iron apple tree entirely covered with pears and lead in the third there was the hare which the dog killed yesterday alive in the basket and in the fourth there were twenty-four hipper switches threshing tobacco and at the sight of me they threshed so hard that they drove the plug through the wall and threw a little dog that was passing by on the other side i hearing the dog howl jumped over the wall and turned it as neatly inside out as possible when it ran away as if it had not an hour to live then he took me into the park to show me his deer and i remembered that i had a warrant in my pocket to shoot venison for his majesty's dinner so i set fire to my bow poised my arrow and shot among them I broke seventeen ribs on one side, and twenty-one and a half on the other, but my arrow passed clean through without ever touching it, 
and the worst was i lost my arrow however i found it again in the hollow of a tree i felt it it felt clammy i smelt it it smelt honey oh ho said i here's a bee's nest when out sprang a covey of partridges i shot at them some say i killed eighteen but i am sure i killed thirty-six besides a dead salmon which was flying over the bridge of which i made the best apple pie i ever tasted end of chapter sixty two recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Chapter 63 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Wolfgang Bass. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 63. Tom Tit Tot. Once upon a time there was a woman and she baked five pies and when they came out of the oven they were that overbaked the crust were too hard to eat so she says to her daughter daughter says she put you them their pies on the shelf and leave em there a little and they'll come again she meant you know the crust would get soft but the girl she says to herself well if they'll come again i'll eat em now and she sat to work and ate em all first and last well come supper time and the woman said go you and get one of them their pies i dare they've come again now the girl went and she looked and there was nothing but the dishes so back she came and says she no they ain't come again not one of em said the mother not one of them says she well come again or not come again said the woman i'll have one for supper but you can't if they ain't come said the girl but i can said she go you and bring the best of em best or worst said the girl i ate em all and you can't have one till that's come again well the woman she was done and she took her spin into the door to spin and as she span she sang my daughter have ate five five pies to-day my daughter have ate five five pies to-day the king was coming down the street and he heard her sing but what she sang he couldn't make out so he stopped and said what was that you were singing my good woman the woman was ashamed to let him hear what her daughter had been doing so she sang instead of that my daughter have spun five five skeins to-day my daughter have spun five five skeins to-day stars of mine said the king i've never heard tell of any one that could do that then he said look you here i want a wife and i'll marry your daughter but look you here said he eleven months out of the year she can have all she likes to eat and all the gowns she likes to get and all the company she likes to keep but the last months of the year she'll have to spin five skeins every day and if she don't i shall kill her all right says the woman for she thought what a grand marriage that was and as for the five skeins when the time came there'd be plenty of ways of getting out of it and likeliest he half forgotten all about it well so they were married and for eleven months the girl had all she liked to eat and all the gowns she liked to get and all the company she liked to keep but when the time was getting over she began to think about the skins and to wonder if he had em in mind but not one word did he say about em and she thought he'd wholly forgotten them however the last day of the last month he takes her to a room she'd never set eyes on before 
There was nothing in it but a spinning wheel and a stool, and says he, Now, my dear, he'll be shut in tomorrow with some victuals and some flags, and if you haven't spun five skeins by the night, your hat'll go off. And away he went about his business. Well, she was that frightened. She'd always been such a godless girl that she didn't so much as know how to spin, and what was she to do tomorrow with no one to come nigh her to help her? She sat down on a stool in the kitchen, and la, how did she cry? However, all of a sudden she heard a sort of a knocking low down on the door. She upped and upped it, and what should she see but a small little black thing with a long tail that looked up at her right curious, and that said, What are you crying for? What's that to you? says she. Never you mind, that said. But tell me, what are you crying for? That won't do me no good if I do, says she. You don't know that, that said, and twirled that tail round. Well, says she, that won't do no harm if that don't do no good. And she upped and told about the pies and skeins and everything. This is what I'll do, says the little black thing. I'll come to your window every morning and take the flax and bring it spun at night. What's your pay? says she. That looked out of the corner of that eyes, and that said, I'll give you three guesses every night to guess my name. And if you haven't guessed it before the month's up, you shall be mine. Well, she thought she'd be sure to guess that's name before the month was up. All right, says she. I agree. All right, that says. And lo, how that twirled that tail. Well, the next day her husband took her into the room, and there was a flax and the day's food. Now there's the flax, says he, and if that ain't spun up this night, off goes your hat. And then he went out and locked the door. He'd hardly gone when there was knocking against the window. She upped and she upped it, and there sure enough was the little old thing sitting on the latch. Where is the flax? says he. Here it be, says she, and she gave it to him. Well, come the evening, and knocking came again to the window. She upped and she upped it, and there was the little old thing with five skins of flax on his arms. Here it be, says he, and he gave it to her. Now, what's my name? says he. Oh, uh, what? Is it Bill? says she. Nah, that ain't, says he, and he twirled his tail. Is it Ned? says she. Nah, that ain't, says he, and he twirled his tail. Well, is it Mark? says she. Nah, that ain't, says he, and he twirled his tail harder, and away he flew. Well, when her husband came in, there were the five skeins ready for him. I see. I shan't have to kill you tonight, my dear, says he. You'll have your food and your flax in the morning, says he, and away he goes. Well, every day the flax and the food were brought, and every day their little black impet used to come mornings and evenings. And all the day the girl sat trying to think of names to say to it when it came at night. But she never hit on the right one. And as it got toward the end of the month, the impet began to look so maliceful, and that twirled that tail faster and faster each time she gave a guess. At last it came to the last day but one. The impet came at night along with the five skeins, and that said, What, ain't you got my name yet? Is it Nicodemus? says she. No, it ain't, that says. Is it 
Sammy, says she. No, tain't, that says. Oh, well, is it Methuselah, says she. No, then neither, that says. The gnat looks at her with that's eyes like a call of fire, and that says, Women, there's only tomorrow night, and then you'll be mine. And away it flew. Well, she felt that horrid. However, she heard the king coming along the passage. In he came, and when he sees the five skeins, he says, says he, Well, my dear, says he, I don't see but what you'll have your skeins ready tomorrow night as well, and as I reckon, I shan't have to kill you. I'll have supper in here tonight. So they brought supper and another stool for him, and down the two sat. Well, he hadn't eaten but a mouthful or so when he stops and begins to laugh. What is it? says she. Oh, why, says he, I was out uh, hunting today, and I got away to a place in the wood I'd never seen before. And I was an old chalk pit, and I heard a kind of a sort of humming. So I got off my hobby, and I went right quiet to the pit, and I looked down. Well, what should there be but the funniest little black thing you've ever set eyes on? And what was that doing, but that had a little spinning wheel, and that was spinning wonderful fast, and twirling that tail. And as that span, that sang, Nimi nimi not, my name is Tom Tot. Well, when the girl heard this, she felt as if she could have jumped out of her skin for joy, but she didn't say a word next day that their little thing looked so maliceful when he came for the flax and when the night came she heard that knocking against the window panes she opened the window and that come right in on the latch that was grinning from ear to ear and ooh, that tail was twirling round so fast what's my name that says as that gave her the skeins is that solomon she says pretending to be afeard no taint that says and that came farther into the room well is it zebedee says she again no taint says the impet and then that laughed and twirled that tail till you couldn't hardly see it take time woman that says next gas and you're mine and that stretched out that black hands at her while well, she backed a step or two and she looked at it and then she laughed out and says she pointing her finger at it nimi nimi not your name is tom tit tot well when that heard her that gave an awful shriek and a way that flew into the dark and she never saw it any more. End of chapter 63。Chapter 64 of Tales of Laughter。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wigan. Chapter 64 The Old Woman and Her Pig Once upon a time an old woman was sweeping her little house, when, to her great joy, she found a silver sixpence. What, said she, shall I do with this little sixpence? I think I will go to market and buy a pig. So the next day she went to market and bought a nice little white pig. She tied a string to one of the pig's legs and began to drive him home. On the way the old woman and her pig came to a stile, and she said, Please, pig, get over the stile. But the pig would not. Just then a little dog came trotting up, and the old woman said to him, Dog, dog, bite pig. Pig won't get over the stile, and I shan't get home tonight. But the dog would not. So the old woman held up her stick and said, Stick, stick, beat dog. Dog won't bite pig. Pig won't get over the stile, and I shan't get home tonight. 
but the stick would not. So the old woman gathered some bits of wood together to make a fire, and set them on fire, and then threw her stick into the fire, and said, Fire, fire, burn stick. Stick won't beat dog, dog won't bite pig, pig won't get over the stile, and I shan't get home tonight. But the fire would not. So the old woman fetched a pail of water that was standing near, and said, Water, water, quench fire, fire won't burn stick, stick won't beat dog, dog won't bite pig, pig won't get over the stile, and I shan't get home tonight. But the water would not. Then the old woman saw an ox coming, so she said, Ox, ox, drink water, water won't quench fire, fire won't burn stick, stick won't beat dog, dog won't bite pig, pig won't go. I see by the moonlight, it's long past midnight, time pig and I were home an hour and a half ago. But the ox would not. So the old woman turned around and saw a butcher, and she said, Butcher, butcher, kill ox, ox won't drink water, water won't quench fire, fire won't burn stick, stick won't beat dog, dog won't bite pig, pig won't go. I see by the moonlight it's long past midnight, time pig and I were home an hour and a half ago. But the butcher would not. So the old woman took a rope out of her pocket and said, Rope, rope, hang butcher, butcher won't kill ox, ox won't drink water, water won't quench fire, fire won't burn stick, stick won't beat dog, dog won't bite pig, pig won't go. I see by the moonlight it's long past midnight, time pig and I were home an hour and a half ago. But the rope would not. Just then a large brown mouse ran across the meadow, and she said, Mouse, mouse, gnaw rope, rope won't hang butcher, butcher won't kill ox, ox won't drink water, water won't quench fire, fire won't burn stick, stick won't beat dog, dog won't bite pig, pig won't go. I see by the moonlight it's long past midnight, time pig and I were home an hour and a half ago. Yes, said the mouse, I will if you give me some cheese. So the old woman put her hand in her pocket and found a nice piece of cheese, and when the mouse had eaten it, the mouse began to gnaw the rope, the rope began to hang the butcher, the butcher began to kill the ox, the ox began to drink the water, the water began to quench the fire, the fire began to burn the stick, the stick began to beat the dog, the dog began to bite the pig, and the pig began to go. But what time the old woman and her pig got home, you nor I nor nobody knows. End of chapter 64 Recording by Evan Smith Chapter 65 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 65. The Story of the Three Little Pigs. There was once an old sow with three little pigs, and as she had not enough to keep them, she sent them out to seek their fortune. The first that went off met a man with a bundle of straw, and said to him, Please, man, give me that straw to build me a house. Which the man did, and the little pig built a house with it. Presently came along a wolf, and knocked at the door, and said, Little pig, little pig, let me come in. To which the pig answered, No, no, by the hair of my chinny-chin-chin. Chin. And the wolf then answered to that, Then I'll huff, and I'll puff, and I'll blow your house in. So he huffed and he puffed and he blew the house in and ate up the little pig. The second little pig met a man with a bundle of furs and said, Please, man, give me that furs to build a house. Which the man did, and the pig built his house. Then along came the wolf and said, Little pig, little pig, let me come in. No, no, by the hair of my chinny-chin-chin. Chin. Then I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house in. So he huffed and he puffed, and he puffed and he huffed, and at last he blew the house down, and he ate up the little pig. The third little pig met a man with a load of bricks, and said, Please, man, give me those bricks to build a house with. So the man gave him the bricks, and he built his house with them. Then the wolf came, as he did with the other little pigs, and said, Little pig, little pig, let me come in. No, no, by the hair on my chinny-chin-chin. Then I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house in. Well, he huffed and he puffed, and he huffed and he puffed, and he puffed and he huffed, but he could not get the house down. When he found that he could not, with all his huffing and puffing, blow the house down, he said, Little pig, I know where there is a nice field of turnips. Where? said the little pig. Oh, in Mr. Smith's home field, and if you will be ready tomorrow morning, I will call for you, and we will go together and get some for dinner. 
"'Very well,' said the little pig. "'I will be ready. What time do you mean to go?' "'Oh, at six o'clock.' Well, the little pig got up at five and got the turnips before the wolf came, which he did about six, when he said, "'Little pig, are you ready?' The little pig said, "'Ready? I have been there and come back again, and got a nice potful for dinner.' The wolf felt very angry at this, but thought that he would be even with the little pig somehow or other. So he said, "'Little pig, I know where there is a nice apple tree.' "'Where?' said the pig. "'Down at Merry Garden,' replied the wolf. "'And if you will not deceive me, I will come for you at five o'clock tomorrow and get some apples.' Well, the little pig bustled up the next morning at four o'clock, and went off for the apples, hoping to get back before the wolf came. But he had farther to go, and had to climb the tree— so that just as he was scrambling down from it, he saw the wolf coming, which, as you may suppose, frightened him very much. When the wolf came up, he said, "'Little pig, what, are you here before me? Are they nice apples?' "'Yes, very,' said the little pig. "'I will throw you down one.' And he threw it so far that while the wolf was gone to pick it up, the little pig jumped down and ran home. The next day the wolf came again and said to the little pig, "'Little pig, there is a fair at Shanklin this afternoon. Will you go? Oh, yes, said the pig. I will go. What time shall you be ready? At three, said the wolf. So the little pig went off before the time, as usual, and got to the fair and bought a butter churn, which he was going home with when he saw the wolf coming. Then he could not tell what to do. So he got into the churn to hide, and by doing so it turned round and rolled down the hill with him inside, which frightened the wolf so much that he ran home without going to the fair. He went to the little pig's house and told him how frightened he had been by a great round thing which came down the hill past him. Then the little pig said, "'Ha! Ah, I frightened you then. I had been to the fair and bought a butter churn, and when I saw you I got into it and rolled down the hill.' Then the wolf was very angry indeed, and declared he would eat up the little pig, and that he would get down the chimney after him. When the little pig saw what he was about, he hung on the pot full of water, and made up a blazing fire, and just as a wolf was coming down, took off the cover, and in fell the wolf. So the little pig put on the cover again in an instant, boiled him up, and ate him for supper, and lived happily ever afterward. End of chapter 65 Recording by Evan Smith Chapter 66 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wigan. Chapter 66. The Three Sillies. Once upon a time there was a farmer and his wife who had one daughter, and she was courted by a gentleman. Every evening he used to come and see her, and stop to supper at the farmhouse, and the daughter used to be sent down into the cellar to draw the beer for supper. So one evening she had gone down to draw the beer, and she happened to look up at the ceiling while she was drawing, and she saw a mallet stuck in one of the beams. It must have been there a long, long time, but somehow or other she had never noticed it before, and she began thinking, and she thought it was very dangerous to have that mallet there, for she said to herself, Suppose him and me was to be married, and we was to have a son, and he was to grow up to be a man, and come down into the cellar to draw the beer, like as I'm doing now, and the mallet was to fall on his head and kill him. What a dreadful thing it would be! And she put down the candle in the jug, and sat herself down and began a-crying. Well, they began to wonder upstairs how it was that she was so long drawing the beer, and her mother went down to see after her, and she found her sitting on the settle crying, and the beer running over the floor. Why, whatever is the matter, said her mother. Oh, mother, says she, look at that horrid mallet. Suppose we was to be married, and was to have a son, and he was to grow up, and was to come down to the cellar to draw the beer, and the mallet was to fall on his head and kill him. What a dreadful thing it would be! "'Dear, dear, what a dreadful thing it would be,' said the mother, and she sat down aside of the daughter and started a-crying too. Then after a bit the father began to wonder that they didn't come back, and he went down into the cellar to look after them himself, and there they too sat a-crying, and the beer running all over the floor. "'Whatever is the matter?' says he. "'Why,' says the mother, "'look at that horrid mallet. 
Just suppose if our daughter and her sweetheart was to be married, and was to have a son, and he was to grow up, and was to come down into the cellar to draw the beer, and the mallet was to fall on his head and kill him, what a dreadful thing it would be! Dear, 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 so it would, said the father, and he sat himself down aside the other two, and started a-crying. Now the gentleman got tired of stopping up in the kitchen by himself, and at last he went down into the cellar, too, to see what they were after, and there they three sat a-crying side by side and the beer running all over the floor. And he ran straight and turned the tap. Then he said, Whatever are you three doing, sitting there crying and letting the beer run all over the floor? Oh, says the father, look at that horrid mallet. Suppose you and our daughter was to be married, and was to have a son, and he was to grow up and was to come down into the cellar to draw the beer, and the mallet was to fall on his head and kill him and then they all started a-crying worse than before. But the gentleman burst out a-laughing, and reached up and pulled out the mallet, and then he said, I've travelled many miles, and I never met three such big sillies as you three before, and now I shall start out on my travels again, and when I can find three bigger sillies than you three, then I'll come back and marry your daughter. So he wished them good-bye and started off on his travels, and left them all crying because the girl had lost her sweetheart. Well, he set out, and he travelled a long way, and at last he came to a woman's cottage that had some grass growing on the roof, and the woman was trying to get her cow to go up a ladder to the grass, and the poor thing durst not go. So the gentleman asked the woman what she was doing. "'Why, look ye, she said, look at all that beautiful grass. I'm going to get the cow on to the roof to eat it.' She'll be quite safe, for I shall tie a string round her neck and pass it down the chimney and tie it to my wrist as I go about the house, so she can't fall off without my knowing it. Oh, you poor silly, said the gentleman, you should cut the grass and throw it down to the cow. But the woman thought it was easier to get the cow up the ladder than to get the grass down, so she pushed her and coaxed her and got her up and tied a string round her neck and passed it down the chimney and fastened it to her own wrist. And the gentleman went on his way, but he hadn't gone far when the cow tumbled off the roof and hung by the string tied around her neck, and it strangled her. And the weight of the cow tied to her wrist pulled the woman up the chimney, and she stuck fast halfway and was smothered in the soot. Well, that was one big silly. And the gentleman went on and on, and he went to an inn to stop the night, and they were so full at the inn that they had to put him in a double-bedded room and another traveller was to sleep in the other bed. The other man was a very pleasant fellow, and they got very friendly together, but in the morning, when they were both getting up, the gentleman was surprised to see the other hang his trousers on the knobs of the chest of drawers, and run across the room and try to jump into them, and he tried over and over again, and couldn't manage it, and the gentleman wondered whatever he was doing it for. At last he stopped and wiped his face with his handkerchief. "'Oh, dear,' he says, I do think trousers are the most awkwardest kind of clothes that ever were. I can't think who could have invented such things. It takes me the best part of an hour to get into mine every morning, and I got so hot. How do you manage yours? So the gentleman burst out a-laughing and showed him how to put them on, and he was very much obliged to him, and said he never should have thought of doing it that way. So that was another big silly. Then the gentleman went on his travels again, and he came to a village, and outside the village there was a pond, and round the pond was a crowd of people, and they had got rakes and brooms and pitchforks reaching into the pond, and the gentleman asked what was the matter. Why, they said, matter enough, moon's tumbled into the pond, and we can't rake her out anyhow. So the gentleman burst out a-laughing and told them to look up into the sky, and that it was only the shadow in the water but they wouldn't listen to him, and abused him shamefully, and he got away as quick as he could. So there was a whole lot of sillies, bigger than those three sillies at home. So the gentleman turned back home again, and married the farmer's daughter, and if they didn't live happily for ever after, that's nothing to do with you or me. End of chapter 66 Recording by Evan Smith Chapter 67 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Evan Smith. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 67. The Cat and the Mouse. The cat and the mouse played in the malt house. The cat bit the mouse's tail off. Pray, puss, said the mouse, give me my long tail again. No, said the cat, I'll not give you your tail again till you go to the cow and fetch me some milk. First she leaped and then she ran till she came to the cow and thus began. Pray, cow, give me some milk that I may give to the cat so she may give me my long tail again. No, said the cow, I will give you no milk till you go to the farmer and get me some hay. First she leaped and then she ran till she came to the farmer and thus began. Pray, farmer, give me some hay that I may give to the cow so she may give me some milk that I may give to the cat so she may give me my long tail again. No, said the farmer, I will give you no hay till you go to the butcher and fetch me some meat. First she leaped and then she ran till she came to the butcher and thus began. Pray, butcher, give me some meat, that I may give to the farmer, so he may give me some hay, that I may give to the cow, so she may give me some milk, that I may give to the cat, so she may give me my long tail again. No, said the butcher, I will give you no meat, till you go to the baker and fetch me some bread. First she leaped, and then she ran, till she came to the baker, and thus began. Pray, baker, give me some bread, that I may give to the butcher, so he may give me some meat, that I may give to the farmer, so he may give me some hay, that I may give to the cow, so she may give me some milk, that I may give to the cat, so she may give me my long tail again. Yes, said the baker, I'll give you some bread, but if you eat my meal, I'll cut off your head. The baker gave the mouse bread, which she brought to the butcher, the butcher gave the mouse meat, which she brought to the farmer, the farmer gave the mouse hay, which she brought to the cow, the cow gave the mouse milk, which she brought to the cat, and the cat gave the mouse her long tail again. End of chapter 67 Recording by Evan Smith Chapter 68 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Hereafter This Once upon a time there was a farmer called Jan, and he lived all alone by himself in a little farmhouse. By and by he thought that he would like to have a wife to keep it all vitty for him. So he went a courting a fine maid, and he said to her, Will you marry me? That I will, to be sure, said she. So they went to church and were wed. After the wedding was over, she got up on his horse behind him, and he brought her home, and they lived as happy as the day was long. One day Jan said to his wife, Wife, can you milk ye? Oh, yes, Jan, I can milk ye. Mother used to milk ye when I lived home. So he went to market and bought her ten red cows. All went well till one day when she had driven them to the pond to drink. She thought they did not drink fast enough so she drove them right into the pond to make them drink faster, and they were all drowned. When Jan came home, she up and told him what she had done, and he said, Oh, well, there, never mind, my dear, better luck next time. So they went on for a bit, and then one day Jan said to his wife, Wife, can you serve pigs? Oh, yes, Jan, I can serve pigs. Mother used to serve pigs when I lived home. So Jan went to market and brought her some pigs. All went well till one day, when she had put their food into the trough. She thought they did not eat fast enough, and she pushed their heads into the trough to make them eat faster, and they were all choked. When Jan came home, she upped and told him what she had done, and he said, Oh, well, there, Never mind, my dear, better luck next time. So they went on for a bit, and then one day Jan said to his wife, Wife, can you bake ye? Oh, yes, Jan, I can bake ye. Mother used to bake ye when I lived home. 
so he brought everything for his wife so that she could bake bread all went well for a bit till one day she thought she would bake white bread for a treat for jan so she carried her meal to the top of a high hill and let the wind blow on it for she thought to herself that the wind would blow out all the bran but the wind blew away meal and bran and all so there was an end of it when jan came home she upped and told him what she had done and he said oh well there never mind my dear better luck next time so they went on for a bit and then one day jan said to his wife wife can you brewy oh yes jan i can brewy mother used to brewy when i lived home so he brought everything proper for his wife to brew ale with all went well for a bit till one day when she had brewed her ale and put it in the barrel a big black dog came in and looked up in her face she drove him out of the house but he stayed outside the door and still looked up in her face and she got so angry that she pulled out the plug of the barrel threw it at the dog and said what dost look at me for i be jan's wife then the dog ran down the road and she ran after him to chase him right away when she came back again she found that the ale had all run out of the barrel and so there was an end of it when jan came home she up and told him what she had done and he said oh well there never mind my dear better luck next time so they went on for a bit and then one day she thought to herself tis time to clean my house when she was taking down her big bed she found a bag of groats on the tester so when jan came home she up and said to him jan what is the bag of groats on the tester for that is for here after this my dear now there was a robber outside the window and he heard what jan said next day he waited till jan had gone to market and then he came and knocked at the door what do you please to want said molly i am here after this said the robber i have come for the bag of groats now the robber was dressed like a fine gentleman so she thought to herself it was very kind of so fine a man to come for the bag of groats so she ran upstairs and fetched the bag of groats and gave it to the robber and he went away with it when jan came home she said to him jan here after this has been for the bag of groats what do you mean wife said jan so she upped and told him and he said then i'm a ruined man for the money was to pay our rent with the only thing we can do is to roam the world over till we find the bag of groats then jan took the house door off its hinges that's all we shall have to lie on he said so jan put the door on his back and they both set out to look for hereafter this many a long day they went and in the night jan used to put the door on the branches of a tree and they would sleep on it one night they came to a big hill and there was a high tree at the foot so jan put the door up in it and they got up in the tree and went to sleep by and by jan's wife heard a noise and she looked to see what it was it was an opening of a door on the side of the hill out came two gentlemen with a long table and behind them fine ladies and lords each carrying a bag and one of them was hereafter this with the bag of groats they sat round the table and began to drink and talk and count up all the money in the bags so then jan's wife woke him up and asked what they should do now's our time said jan and he pushed the door off the branches and it fell right in the very middle of the table and frightened the robbers so that they all ran away then jan and his wife got down from the tree 
took as many money bags as they could carry on the door and went straight home and jan brought his wife more cows and more pigs and they lived happily ever after end of chapter sixty eight recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c